Good morning from Quinby and Best Slater United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor True Luck, and we're coming to you today from Quinby, where the service is already underway. Always appreciate our Facebook and YouTube audience, and of course, I have my congregation here in front of me, and so together we're going to share God's Word today. My message is simply called Be Biblically Correct. Be biblically correct. One of the most popular phrases of our time, I think, is to be politically correct. Hear something about it almost every time you turn the TV on and you read your newspapers, your articles, somebody's talking about being politically correct. And hear it so much and it seems to be changing from time to time that I'm not sure everybody understands what it means anymore. Uh, at times I wonder. So I went back and I just looked up a definition for you this morning to see exactly what it says. And this term is used to describe languages or policies or measures or procedures that are intended to avoid offense or disadvantages to members of any particular group, such as race or uh, ethnic background or gender. And the list goes on. The list goes on, and it's hard to keep up with it. And I don't want anybody to take this out of context today. I think everybody is important, and everybody needs to be loved. But uh, how do we go about doing that? Uh, to try and remember everybody all the time and leave nobody out, you know what? It doesn't work. That's like trying to be saved by works. We've studied that over and over again. You can't be saved by works that would require perfection, and none of us are perfect. And so when it comes to talking about groups and various groups of people, when you try and go about it by remembering some special groups here and there, and it's always changing, guess what? Somebody's always going to be left out. And we don't like to be left out, do we? Just doesn't work that way. But guess what? Being biblically correct works every time. Being biblically correct works every time. Uh, example here is in Luke 10 and 27. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Do you remember the last part of that? Your neighbor as yourself. And then the question comes up, well, who uh, is considered my neighbor? And, uh, a parable was used in about the uh, person who was robbed left by the side of the road and all these different people came by and ignored him and then finally a Samaritan came by and stopped and helped out and did what everybody should have done. And so uh, in that story, the, the one who stopped and uh, showed mercy was the neighbor. So being biblically correct, would be, I would say it this way, to love God first and then love everybody else. No categories, just that we're all God's creation, love everybody. You don't leave anybody out that way. And so everybody becomes our neighbor. The world's way, see, is never as good as God's way. The world's way is never as good as God's way, and it never will be. And our Bible is the go-to place to find out what God's way is, isn't it? Our Bible is the place to go to find out what God's way is. I've heard some Bible scholars, and I use the term loosely in this, in this particular context, say that the Bible is fluid, that it changes as life changes. Don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? The Bible doesn't change. It was never intended to change. And by the time I finish reading some scripture to you today, and I've got a fair amount of scripture, I hope you're going to agree with me if you don't always, already. The Bible doesn't change. Now, people try and change it to go along with current lifestyles, but that does not please God. It doesn't please Him. It's just not true. Matthew 4 and 4, this is Jesus' words. He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every word, not just some. You don't pick and choose. And listen to what Jesus taught in His Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is just a very small part of the Sermon on the Mount, but this gets my point across. 
This is Matthew 5, beginning with verse 17. Matthew 5, beginning with verse 17. Do you think that I have come to abolish the law of the, or the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill them, is what Jesus says. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, or until they pass away, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I like the way that's written. Practices and teaches. That means we practice what we say. We practice what we preach. But do you see how important it is? Jesus says nothing's going to change and you better not be changing my word. I gave it to those who wrote it down exactly the way I wanted it, and it's not to be, not to be uh, changed. In teaching about his return in Matthew 24 and 35, Jesus had these words to say. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. They're not going anywhere. So my point is this, and it's important that... Uh, the only thing that never changes in a constantly changing word, world is God and his word. That's the only thing that doesn't change. Can you think of anything in your life that has not changed since you've been on this planet? Everything changed. We've had things change in our lives over this last week, if we'll be honest with ourselves. Things are always changing. So how do you ever have any stability in your life? How do you ever be comfortable with where you are? if everything's gonna change. Listen to Jesus' words, and this is at the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew, the seventh chapter, beginning with the 24th verse. He says, therefore, in other words, I've, I've taught you all this other stuff, and therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, there it is again, practice what we preach. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice as like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But, it's always a but in there, isn't it? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. See, we need the stability of God's word in our lives. We need that. We need that. Everybody does, whether they admit it or not. We need that stability. We're also taught that God's word is our principal weapon against the enemy. So it's our rock, it's our foundation, but it's a weapon. And sometimes we forget that it's a weapon. This little book here. That's our only offensive weapon that we have. Everything else God gave us is, is defensive. This is our weapon. Matthew 4 says, Jesus rebuked Satan's temptations three times by correctly quoting scripture. One of the very first things that our Lord did when he started his ministry has run up against Satan. And Satan tried his best to make our Lord fall. And three temptations were thrown at him by misquoting scripture. And three times Jesus threw it right back at him by quoting the scripture in the correct way. It is important that we know what is in this book. It's important that we spend time with it because Satan has not gone away. He will still use the word to trip us up if he can. There's still people out there misquoting the word. Some of them, because they don't know any better than others intentionally because they want to get in their way. They want to support the fact that they can say everything is changing and God's word is fluid. So we're going to change with it. We've got to know the word of God. We've got to stand by it. We need that stability. It's our weapon. In Ephesians 6, 
Listen to what it says about the Word. God's Word is included as part of the arm of God. And we've, we've had lessons on the arm of God over the years, and there's various parts to that, but an important part of it is, is, is the Word. Verse 17 in Ephesians 6 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, the sword's a weapon in it, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. Our weapon is the Word of God. In Hebrews 4 and 12, we read it this way. For the Word of God is alive. The Word of God is active. Sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thought and attitudes of the heart. I love that thought. This is the living Word of God should bring life to us. When we sit down with him, we should experience God in a real way. It's almost as if we're talking to him. You know, it's his word. It's his word. Some will say, well, he didn't write it all. It's important that you don't skip out, skip any scripture. 2 Timothy 16 and 17 says it this way. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. You don't just have to hang on to the red letter the part, as Jesus said. You don't just hang on to the part where God gave to man through his, through, his, through his people and to his people. All scripture is given by God by inspiration. And that word inspiration in his passage means God breathed. Words came directly from God. He breathed. A man wrote them down. But the God breathed. And <clears throat> it's all profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction and righteousness. So all of it is important to us. All of it should become a part of our life. It's the only way we'll know the whole story. Verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works for God. All good works for God. One commentator wrote it this way, and I, I like so much what he said, I just, I just took it down just like he said it, pretty much. It didn't change much. He says, the Word of God is not simply a collection of words from God or a vehicle for communicating ideas. That's the way a lot of people think of it. They think it's just another book. <clears throat> just another book like you'd study any other book if you were going to school or just some subject that you enjoy reading about. The Word of God is not simply a collection of words from God. What a terrible thing if that's what you think it is. You're missing the boat. It's not just a vehicle for communicating ideas. He's, this commentator said it is living, life-changing, and dynamic as it works in us. How does it going to work in us? It can only work in us if it becomes a part of us. It can only work in us if we make it a part of our daily lives if we read it, if we study it. It's living. It's life changing. And don't take that word living to mean that it's changing. It's not what it says. But it's alive. It becomes a part of who we are. With the incisiveness of a surgeon's knife, God's word reveals who we are and who we are not. You ever find that out when you were reading and studying the Bible? Makes you face up to things maybe you don't want to face up to, to other things. And, you know, you might make you kind of sit up in this chair and say, that's kind of who I am now. I'm pleased. Other times you may have to hang your head and say, I'm not as good as I thought I was. Maybe I got some more work to do. God's work should be a part of us that way so it becomes a part of who we are. And he said, reveals who we really are and who we are not. That's the only way we can grow. It penetrates the core of our moral and spiritual life. <clears throat> Something penetrates and goes deep, doesn't it? Gets down to the, the core, to the point. It discerns what is within us, both good and evil. It convicts us. It makes us face up to realities. The demands of God's word require decisions. Have you found that to be true? If you're really reading and studying, it requires decisions. I've told you before that I think every good sermon requires a decision. I don't know if I've been successful in doing that with you, but it's been my goal. Every good sermon requires a decision of some type. 
And it's not necessarily a decision that everybody else sees. It's not necessarily a decision like your, maybe your salvation decision where you come to an altar or something, but it requires that. God's word should require decisions from you. You either getting it right, or maybe the things you need to change, or maybe there's somebody you need to go witness to and you realize that through the scripture. We must not only listen to the word, we must let it shape our lives. Just let it shape our lives. People ought to be able to see God's word active in the way we live and not just in the things we say. You notice a couple of these scriptures said the way we act, the way we do things. We're not just reading the word, we, we're living the word. So it brings us to a point of conviction with the help of the Holy Spirit and makes us realize that we're sinners, that we need the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives and to take away our sins. That's why so many people, not all, so many people get saved in church services where they've heard the word. That's why uh, uh, evangelical services and revivals and stuff, you know, where they really, we really focus on people's salvation. It usually starts with the word and the preaching of the word, doesn't it? It's usually some good music involved. The Holy Spirit gets to move in in the service. Before you know it, people are getting saved. People are getting saved. But they hear the word, and it's convicting. Ephesians 2 and 8, surely you all know this one. I preached on this sermon for how many weeks? Ephesians 2 and 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no man can boast. So the Holy Spirit convicts us and we invite Christ in and our sins are forgiven. See, the Holy Spirit works hand in hand with the Word. He becomes our comforter and our counselor. He will help us understand and, and interpret the Bible the way it needs to be interpreted. He reveals the truth to us as we read it. That's why we can read the Bible over and over again and every time get something new out of it. Sometimes we can read the same passage of Scripture over, over and over again and keep getting different messages out of the same passage. And all of them be right. It just speaks to you in different ways that mean some of it's wrong. But God's Word can do that. It comes to life. Do you feel like that when you sit down and you're holding that in your hand and you're reading it and studying it, You've got something living here in my hands. I've got a connection here with my Lord. This is him speaking to me through these written words. He inspired these words, knowing that sometime way in the future, the Gerald Truelux is going to be sitting there studying the words. He's going to need this. He inspired it. It comes to life and we understand why it's called the living word. When we experience it in a way that maybe we never have before. It's important. I want to close with a song. A psalm of comfort that most of us learn as a child. And I picked this one for that very reason. Most of us know it. We think we know it. We quote it. We learn to quote it. Sometimes in my generation, we could do these things in school, couldn't we? Don't do it in school anymore, but it would be part of the morning devotion when we start to school. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm. We don't always understand the whole message here. People read it as if it's intended for everybody. It's intended for the sheep. It's intended for the flock. And everybody's not a part of the flock. You know, the scripture says that we the sheep or, or we goats. I don't want to be a goat. I want to be part of Jesus' flock. He died for all the sheep, but not all have accepted that gift. He died for all of us, but not everybody has accepted it. So don't let that be you. You know, if you've read and studied God's Word, then you know this. If you haven't, you may not understand that. Be sure that you're biblically correct, you know, as you go through it. And, and uh, don't just assume things without being sure. Listen to the words just the way it starts. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, if you haven't studied the Bible and if you don't understand salvation and really know the whole Bible, you might just skip right over the importance of that. This is for 
his his sheep. His sheep. He's my shepherd if I've allowed him to be. But if I haven't, I'm not going to get the comfort out of the psalm I'm supposed to have because I'm not there. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. See how personal this is. And all this personal stuff depends on whether or not he's my shepherd and I'm his sheep. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All of that's true, if the first line is true. The Lord is my shepherd. If he's not my shepherd, the rest of it is not true, is it? It's important that we study the Word of God that we understand it, and we study it over and over again, that we make it a part of who we are. I would say today, that be sure that today that you're biblically correct in what you think and what you believe. Biblically correct. Live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, the mouth of God, that's what scripture says. To include in that the inspired word. Don't let anybody just go through and just pick out the things Jesus said are just things that God said himself to a prophet or something. My words, my Bible says everything in here is inspired by him. Spend time with him daily. Be a student of the word. And then God will use you and you will be able to use that experience to help other people and to introduce them to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, thank you. Uh, we would invite you to come out and visit with us. If you have a church home now, I encourage you to be in your church home. But if you don't, we'd love to have you at Quimby or Bethsaida. And uh, we'd make you feel welcome, I promise you. And uh, maybe to some of our people that didn't get to worship with us today, remember always that when you're not here that you're missed. Lou and I love you. And we're praying for you. But until next time, may God bless you all.